Good morning. Hi, Mr. Rosenthal. Good morning. All right, let's get back to this same problem while we have time since we're early. You guys can find the mean, use a calculator if you need, and the MAD for both. Good morning, Mr. Rosenthal. Good morning. I had an A hole. Hmm. All right, we're going to get started in a minute here. Does anybody have their notes from yesterday? What did we get the what was the median uh what was the mean for Pedro? Thirty-five and one eighth. And what was the mad? One point three seven five. All right. So now we can just work on Annika. I'm going to get started, even though we're a little early, because you know people will know where we picked up from. Okay, so now I'm going to separate this and do Annika's data set. So now we're doing Annika. And here we go. Here's our data. So I have 30, 30, 30, 31, 31, 31, 31, 32, 32, 32. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. Is that how is that right? Three, seven, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. I must be missing something. <coughs> three thirties, four thirty ones, three thirty twos, two thirty threes, two thirty fives, a thirty six, a thirty seven, a thirty eight. Let me count again. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. What am I doing wrong here? Three thirties. You counted the dots wrong. Four thirty ones, three thirty twos, two thirty threes, two thirty fives. You you counted the dots wrong. Three, seven, ten, twelve, fourteen. 15, 16, 17, yes, thank you. So it is 17, okay, just making sure. Okay. So, let's see, on a calculator, I can do 30 times 17, because they all are in the 30s. That'll give me 5, 10, and then I can just add up all the single digits. One, two, three, four, six, eight, ten, sixteen, twenty-six, thirty-two, thirty-nine, forty-seven. 10, 16, 26, 32, 39, 47. So 557 divided by 17 gives me about... 32.764, I'll just do 32.76. So I have a mean of about 32. I can do 765, All right? Now to do the MAD. So I am not gonna share screen now. I'm gonna have this angle down so you can see where I'm at. And then the distance each data point is from, good morning, by the way, each data point is a certain distance from the mean. Okay, so 30 is 2.765. And we'll get three of those. Maybe I'll do a times three. And then 31 is 1.765 away times four. Okay. 32 is 0 0.765 away times three. All right. 33 is 0.235 away. And that's times two. 35 is, 35 is, um, 2.235, and there's two of those. 36 is 3.235 away, and there's one of those, and then 4.235 and 5.235. Okay, and then they're divided by 17 to average it out. So the average distance away from the mean is our MAD. Questions so far? Okay, so some calculator work. 2.765 times three plus, I'm gonna do parentheses here. 1.765 times four, close the parentheses, plus parentheses again, 0.765 times three, close the parentheses, plus, now I'm on this one, parentheses, 0.235 times two, close parentheses, plus parentheses, 2.235 times two, close parentheses, plus, and then I'll just add these each, 3.235 plus 4.235 plus 5.235, 
and I got 35.295. And then I'm going to divide that by 17. And now I have my MAD. What does MAD stand for? Mean absolute variation, or mean absolute deviation. Yeah, and you know, it's kind of the same thing, deviation and variation, they're similar. Okay, so I get this, I get um, 2.076, all right? And so that MAD is more than the other one. It doesn't seem like a large MAD, but let's go back to our shared screen. Mr. Osmond, um, yeah. for the, Mean I got thirty four point eight two of that. Um, for for Annika? Yeah. Did you get five fifty seven when you added all all the values? Uh. No, I got five ninety two. Maybe I added it. Um, I'll try again. What did you? What did everybody else get? Same as you. Same as me, okay. Let's see if anything's going on in the chat here. Nothing, okay. All right, so, you know, you look at those distributions there. I'm sharing the screen with you. And Annika's mad came out to slightly more. All right, but not much more. What does that mean again? Her email, like her incoming emails are less consistent every day. I mean, or, yeah. They're more spread out, right, but yeah. not by much. But not by much, all right? But the MAD doesn't tell you who's getting more emails. That would be the mean or the median. And you can see Pedro's mean is, he's getting on average three more emails per day than she is. And if you look at that, you know, look at where the middle of her data is, is somewhere around 32. Um, you know, if you let the other dots kind of push it over to the right a little bit. And then his dots are somewhere around 36-ish, right? Maybe 35-ish, right? And that is about three, all right? And so you could see that. His are moved over. The variation, his are a little bit more clumped up, which explains why the MAD is lower, okay? All right, and the, their ranges are not large. Look at the overall range. What's Annika's overall range? Eight. Eight. Pedro's overall range is what? Eight. Five. His overall range is not eight. Five. It's five. So he's got a smaller range, but both of them are a small range. It's only a range of eight emails. So a mad, the MAD being 1.3 and 2, them seeming to not, that not be significant. Well, if you look at that as a percentage of the overall range, that might be, it might be something to consider. So let's, let's do that. The book doesn't ask us to do that. But if we take Pedro's MAD, 1.375 divided by his range, I wonder, it's like 27.5% of his range. Mr. Osmo, no. And then no. her range, her MAD is 2.076. I'm just playing around with this. Divided by her range of eight, versus, I don't know what that's giving us. See how you can play around with this data. You can have fun with it. But um, all right, any questions? Somebody was speaking. Oh, you got it, okay. All right, let's move on. Remember, this is gonna be short, folks. All right. Only one symmetric population. So let's see what that's all about. You can compare two populations when only one is symmetric. The mean and median of a symmetric distribution are very similar if not the same. Sometimes that's exactly the same if you have a, which one, by the way, in the picture is symmetric? Treetop tours or zip adventures? Zip. Yeah, it's very symmetric. The whiskers are the same, the median's in the middle. Treetop tours is not symmetric. It has a longer whisker on the left. That means they have a bigger outlier that's a lower, you know, the lower outlier 
the lower extreme is, is further away than the upper extreme is from the rest of the data. Okay. Uh, which company has the greater number of daily participants? Treetop tours. Okay. But they want us to compare the centers of the variations of the two populations. All right. So what does that mean comparing the centers? What are the types of things we want to look at? The median. Median. The upper quartile and the lower quartile. Yeah, so that interquartile range, is it stretched out? Or is it close to the middle? Well, for treetop tours, it's more stretched out. And then zip adventures, it's closer to the middle. Why would the median bar not be in the middle of the interquartile range? Why, what would stretch, what would make that stretch out? Because the median means that half of the data is to the right of the median. Half of the, even in treetop tours, half of the data is to the right of the median line. Half of the data is to the left. What is it that makes it so stretched out then? Uh, a longer whisker on one side. Not just the longer whisker. Just the inter so you could get a longer whisker, but the box could still be, have the median in the middle, right? Yeah. Or could you, I don't know. Yeah, if you offset it, right? If right. you offset it on the other side. Okay, so what does it mean in the box to have the median line not be in the middle of the box? Why is the box elongated on one side? Because, well, there are less numbers on that side. Is an equal amount of data on the left of the median line as on the right? No. No. There's more spread out then. Yeah. Ah, you got it. The data is spread out on which oh. side, the left or the right? Left. Do you all agree with that? <laughs> the box is elongated because the data is spread out? Yeah. Yes. So the data on the left of the median for treetop tours in the interquartile range, but to the left of the median bar, that data is further away. It's still in the interquartile range, but it's further away from the median than the data on the right. So yeah. the data on the right is clumped near the, me the median. So when you go above 70, now what is 70? What are they measuring? 70 what? Daily participants, right? Mm -hmm. 70 participants is the median amount. When you go above 70, you got a lot of occurrences happening that are close to 70, that are between 70 and 80. So you had a lot of those that are within 10 above 70. But below it, you had the same amount of occurrences, but they were in a range of 50 to 70, right? So that data was more spread out, as ever yeah. said. Okay, so now we've investigated why would a bar not be right in the center? Well, because on one side, it's more spread out, and on the other side, it's tighter. It's more consistent on the other side of the bar. If there, were, if there was like the same amount of data points on one side on then on the other side then the median would be wait wait no 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 there are even in treetop tours there are the same amount of data points it's, it's just what the values of those data points are yeah because easy. remember what median is median is the value that's right in the middle of all the data i'm saying like if the data points are even or like the equally spread out that's what i mean if they're equally spread out. Then it would be right in the middle. Yes, symmetrical, yes. If they were evenly spread out on the left and as are they, are, they are on the right within the interquartile range. Okay, within the box. Mm -hmm. Mr. Rosenthal? And, and then the whiskers, oh. the whiskers not being the same, have to do with the lower quarter of the data and the upper quarter of the data being not evenly distributed. Okay, so the right whisker, that data is clumped up and the left whisker for treetop tours is spread out as well. That's what explains the uh, disproportionate whiskers. Okay, somebody said Mr. Rosenthal. 
Yeah. So, um, um, on the whiskers, can any, um, like, can any dots be on the whiskers, or are those the only dots, like? On no, the uh, there are going to be points. There's going to be a quarter. Oh. A quarter of the data lies on each whisker. Oh, okay. Remember, the first quarter of the football game is the is the left whisker. All your quarter of your data is in there. Then okay. between the between the left edge of your box and the median, that's the second quarter of the game. That has just as much data in it as the left whisker. Okay. And then of course the third quarter is the the upper part of the box. And then the right whisker is the fourth quarter of the game. Right? In our analogy. Right. Okay. Okay, now let's look what the book says. The distribution for Zip Adventures is symmetric, while the distribution for treetop tours is not symmetric. Use the median and the interquartile range to compare the populations, which we did. So the median for treetop tours versus Zip Adventures are different. So it, it just means that uh, treetop tours is getting more, more um, daily participants. But it has a bigger range. So let's see what their interpretation is. Overall, Treetop Tours has a greater number of daily participants. However, Treetop Tours also has a greater variation. So it is more difficult to predict how many participants they may have on a given day. So Zip Adventures has a greater consistency in their distribution. And that's really what we talked about. Okay. All right. Now we're gonna do this one. I'm gonna let you guys do this one. The double dot plot shows Kareem's and Martin's, let me get it up on my screen, race times for different three-mile races. Compare the centers and variations of the two populations. Which runner is more likely to run a faster race? So uh, they said using the median is when you have a Median and interquartile range, what did they say? It's good when it's symmetrical, that it matches the mean, right? Yeah. The mean and the median are the sa are yeah. often the same when you have a more symmetrical distribution. Here you can see Kareem has a symmetrical distribution and Martin does not, okay? So go ahead and, and, and which, you know, Compare the centers and variations of the populations and which runner is more likely to run a faster race. Hmm, this could be tricky. I'm making, a, I'm going to make a double box and whisker plot. Why don't you guys practice making a box and whisker? To Martin in red. Okay. And then how many race times do we have here? 15 race times. So what will the median be? Which data point? It'll be the eighth one. Okay, and that means there will be seven data points to the left of that. So what's in the middle of the set? What's in the middle of seven data points? It's the fourth one. So 15. 
and then seven data points to the right of the eighth. So it'll be the fourth one after. 19. Here we go. I got Martin's box and whisker plot. You guys still there? Yeah. Yellow. Yes. No. I'm going to unshare for a second just so you guys can get a better look at my box and whisker for Martin. It's a tricky question because more likely you have to consider consistency, don't you? Yeah, you want someone who can like finish within like one and two to two minutes of like their usual time. Well, who know who gets to set what that is? I don't know. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and do Kareem's box and whisker. You should try to practice making a box and whisker. What do you need? You need five values, lower extreme, upper extreme, median, lower quartile, upper quartile. Okay, I'm gonna do that for Kareem now. Above Martin's, and I'm gonna do it in a different color. 16, 20. Yeah, Kareem has a much smaller range. Wait, how is it? How is it you're putting down the dots? Are they random or? Um... No, I'm going off of the lowest and the highest value. Okay. These are the extremes. Now I'm going to take the median. Let me just make sure there's still 15 data points. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh no, there's only 14. So Martin had 15 attempts. Kareem only had 14 attempts. Okay, so it's a uh, slightly different. So it would be the seventh and the eighth. And they're both on 18. It's gonna be a nice symmetrical box. Yeah, that's so what an, um, the first quartile for Martin, uh, beyond uh, 15. 15. Right. Yeah, it is. I do have it on 15. Actually, six. Uh, oh, yeah. It okay. would be the fourth dot. Oh, okay, cool. Okay. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eighteen. No, 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 no. I want the Actually, it'd be on um, 10. I want the 10th dot. 16 because 17 has three dots. 19. All right. Give me one. Wait, how would you get the uh, upper and lower extreme? They're just the highest and lowest dot. Oh. Okay. Should it be on 16? I have mine. It has three dots on it. Take a look at my box and whisker plots. Wait, Mr. Rosenthal, I think it should be on 16 because um, 17 has three dots on it, so um, it will be on the fifth one. Are you on Kareem or Martin? Martin. Okay, so you're doing Martin, and you're saying that you think that what? It's um, one of the, the first quartile should be on uh, 16 because there's um, three dots on 17. Two dots on 16, so it would be on the fifth one. Why would it be on there? How many data points are there total? Uh, in the, there would be. Uh, let's write nine. them out for Martin. So huh? you have four, four, okay. 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 16, 16, 16 17, 17, 17, 18, 19, 19, 21, 21, 23. 15 data points. Okay, so left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. There's the median. Oh. Here's your lower extreme. Here's your upper extreme. Upper extreme. Okay, so now this half of the data under the median, and this is the upper half of the data, find the median of that. So left, right, left, right, left, right, it's 15. Oh, now I get it. Lower quartile. Here, left, right, 
left, yeah. right, left, right, 19 is the upper quartile, lower quartile. Oh, okay, now it's good. And that matches my, my box and whisker. These numbers are these dots. And Kareem oh, is the same, cool. and Kareem is symmetrical. Kareem is symmetrical. That median's right in the middle. Okay. Now, for this one, it looks like my median is symmetrical in the interquartile range. Right? You, you see that, folks, for Martin? Look here. That bar is right in the middle of my box, but my whiskers are not symmetrical. All right? That means I have, um, I have a quarter of my, um, a quarter of the time, 25% of the time, Martin is going to run somewhere in here. 25% of the time, he's going to run between 17 and 19 seconds, uh, minutes. What is this for the what time? Three mile races. Uh, it's minutes. Minute. Yeah. So 25% of the time, he's going to run between 17 and 19 minutes. 25% of the time, he's going to run between 15 and 17 minutes. And 25% of the time, Martin is going to run between 14 and 15 minutes. Kareem, on the other hand, 25% of the time, he's going to run between uh, 19 and 20 minutes. 25% of the time, he's going to run between 18 and 19 minutes. 25% of the time, he's going to run between 17 and 18 minutes. And 25% of the time, he's going to run between 16 and 17 minutes. So who do you pick to win the race? On a just You show up for the race that day. Who is more likely to win? Kareem. Kareem. Really? Even though Martin's median is lower? Yeah. Because he's, he's more consistent and his range is smaller. But okay. the, range, the range between each. Let's start like, adding these things. If you feel risky, you could do the other guy. Let's let's compare the boxes only. Let's let's compare. Let's say fifty percent of the time they're running in the box. You could even do the bottom seventy-five percent. The bottom seventy-five percent here, and the bottom seventy-five percent here is there. I'm picking Martin, I think. Yeah. Because look, even though you're consistently running there, I can count on on Kareem to run in there. Yeah. But but that matches that matches Martin, except more than 25% of the time. 25% and then some Martin will run faster than anything Kareem has ever done. More than, more than a quarter of the time, that's going to happen. And then the rest of the time, the, the rest of the 75%, you don't know. They can run. It's, it's, you, know, you don't know what's going to happen in here. They can, they can run the same anywhere in here. It's, you don't favor anybody when you're here and here. Okay? If you were to say, let's look at just the middle of the data only, mm. right? And you compare their middles. Well, if they run the worst of their middle and he runs the worst of his middle, it's the same, okay? But if, if they run the best. Yeah, and if they, if, if they run their medians, then Martin, Martin wins. wins. And if they run in the low, in quarter two, if they both run in their quarter two, Martin wins. Yeah. Or they tie at best. So by me looking at these side by side like this, um, it looks like I'm, even though Martin is inconsistent, Martin could definitely run in here. He only runs in this whisker one out of four times. So if you're going probability, and I say three out of four times, or 75% of the time, Martin's going to be somewhere in here, then I like my odds because, because that's, that looks to me, Kareem said three out of four times he's going to run in here. And that's not necessarily going to be better than, than, than Martin's. 
the only time that like Kareem is going to win is if he runs the second quartile and then Martin finishes in his third quartile or Martin goes to his upper extreme, like somewhere around that area. Yeah. And then like Kareem can like run anything and then he would win, but Martin can win like 75% or like about 50% of the time. Martin will beat Kareem. Oh no, Andy, I accidentally touched your diamond thing. But I put it back. Ryan, you're not muted. Muted, yeah. Okay, let me go back to share screen. We're at 64 participants. That's great. That's good. Yep. Oh, that's and that's it, folks. So here's what I want to do now. I'm going to go to an early office hours at this point. And I'm going to answer any questions about 10-1 through 10-4. Wow. And then tomorrow, we're going to take our quiz. All right? So if you have no questions, you are now free to go. And if you do have questions, I'm going to spend the rest of this time answering any questions about statistics. And that's where we're do going we to have... close out our statistics. Do we have any homework? Yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry. Before you go. That's, oh, that's my right. God. Good point. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, I lost participants. Lost 20. No. Yeah, oops. Oh, no. People were so quick to get out. Jeez Louise. Oh, yeah. They'll, they'll okay. see it on Schoology. So, yeah, it's going to be 10-4 evens. Yes, and they will see it on Schoology. Yeah. Also, check your updates. I put that there's a quiz tomorrow in the updates. Yeah, we saw what is that? I, I'm only giving you an hour. So, it's 10, 10 to 11. I'll submit the – I'll put the quiz up maybe five to ten minutes early. So you're not going to have the full 100 minutes. I'm cutting like a ha 30 minutes off of that. So Mr. You're going to have like 70 me. minutes, 60 to 70 minutes. But how long is quiz, this test, though? It's, it, it is what it is. You have 60 to 70 minutes to complete and upload. Excuse me. Uh, Mr. Rosenthal? Mm-hmm. So on the quiz, are they going to tell you if you need to find the mat, like the mad and the mean? Or use like a box plot? I, I don't know. You have to know how to do all that stuff. Excuse me. Wait, do we um, have yes, uh, Apollo, yes. For the 10 through 20 or 10 through a billion evens, what pages are they? It is 10 4. And you can go open your book and you can find 10 4. And then you'll go okay. to the guide, start at guided practice number two and do all the evens until the hot topic problem. Uh, Mr. Rosenthal? Yes. To find the MAD, you just find the mean of the, the set of data you have, and then um, you see how far away each point of data is from the mean. You okay? Yes. And then you average out all the things. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. Uh, Mr. Rosenthal? Mm -hmm. So, um, when you're drawing a box plot and you're, um, or the box in whiskers, um, and you want to plot a point for the um, lower quartile and the upper quartile, you just get the median of... Um, of the lower half of the data. Of the, so, like, in between the lower extreme and the median it's, is for the yes. lower half, the yes. lower quartile? Now, oh, okay. there's a couple ways to do that. So let's say that I have one, two, three, four, five data points. Uh, let me do more than that. Seven data points. Okay, here's your lower extreme, here's your median, here's your upper extreme. Okay, so if you only have one median, then you don't use the median when you do this. Do not use it. It's so you don't. You don't try to capture the median and then capture it on the right-hand side too, then you're capturing it twice. No, you don't play that game. It's the lower half is below the median. The upper half is above. And so this here is your lower quartile. And then out of these three numbers, this here is your upper quartile. Okay, and if it's two medians, then you... Yeah, let's add an eight. 
then you so just take one, one of the medians. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now you have two numbers in the middle. So 4.5 is your median. So now I can actually grab the four because the four is not the median. 4.5 is the median. So I can grab the four and I can separately grab the five and there's no overlap, okay? Mm -hmm. So now that I've grabbed the four and the five for the lower half of the data, the average of two and three is 2.5 and the average of six and seven is 6.5. And then one is your lower extreme, eight is your upper extreme. Those are your five data points. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay. Wait, bye. So, so I understand how there's the, the median, there's the lower extreme and the upper extreme, but what are the two other points? Lower quartile and upper quartile. What does that mean? It means that 25% of your data is between those. 25% of your data is between those. 25% of your data is between those numbers. And 25% of your data is between those numbers. And what's the easiest check, way? Check it out. Where's 2.5? It's right here, right? How many, how many numbers are there in the data that are under 2.5? Two. How many pieces of data are between 2.5 and 4.5? Two. Two. How many are between 4.5 and 6.5? Two, two and two. So you can see there's two data points in each quartile. Also, I had another question. So uh -huh. I, I was having trouble um, like with the MAD because I understand like how to find it and everything, but is there like an easier way to find it? Because like it takes a lot of effort to find it. Like there's a lot of stuff to do. That is what statistics is like. The another easier, no, and the only other easier way to do it would be to, um, maybe there's a calculator that you can put in the values and it calculates it for you. Maybe. But that's, I don't think we want to go there. <laughs> Yeah, some graphing calculators, you know, might find that for you. There are statistics components to calculators that will do that for you, but then you're not learning how to do it. You're just plugging, you're just putting the numbers from the problem and letting the calculator give you an answer. That's not really testing you. Okay, so it, when you get to statistics, AP stats in, in high school maybe, perhaps, or in college, if you take a stats course, that's how it is. It's tedious. It's a trade-off. So, Math itself is not that difficult. Lots of mistakes. So the made. upper quartile and the is the upper quartile and the lower quartile like the first quartile and the third quartile? Yes. Which is a little confusing because it's really the end of the first quarter. It's not the first quarter of data. It's the, it marks the separation between the first and the second quarters. So the first quartile is, you can refer to it less confusingly, is the lower quartile. And then the third quartile is the upper quartile. Other questions? How do you find the interquartile range? It's the upper quartile minus the lower quartile. It's not the median of them, no. The median of the first and third quartiles is, is the median. How to find the MAD? You have a set of data. We'll make it real simple. Let's just do five data points. They're not evenly distributed, but okay. Find the mean. So add them up, four, eight, 16, 25, perfect. Divided by five data points. So your mean is five. X bar is the mean. So what you're finding when you find a MAD, uh, mean absolute deviation, is you're finding the average distance away from five that each of these are. How far away from five is one? It's four away. 
How far away is the three from the mean? Two. How far away is the four? One. How far away is the eight? Three away. How far away is the nine? Four away. These are, what are these numbers? These are all the distances away from the mean each data point, original data point is. Average that out and that's what the mat is. So average them by adding them and dividing by five. Six, oh. seven, 10, 14 divided by five. Okay, which is thank two, you. Two and four fifths or 2.8. So the average distance away for each data point is 2.8. Thank you. Okay. By the way, that mad does not help you with individual points seeing, oh, well, that one's far away. That's not 2.8 because the idea of an average is so that you can compare it to something else. If the average compared to another average is bigger or smaller, it talks about how spread out the data are or how consistent. Another way to think of it is consistency of the data. All right. So if the data is less consistent, then your mad gets higher. So if you're looking for predictability, you want to try to get your MAD to be lower. Not that you're trying to do anything. As a scientist, you don't try to get an outcome. What you're trying to do is you're trying to make an observation and use that to, to, you know, to see if something's predictable, right? And if your data is spread out, you're getting lots of different results that you know, are spread out. It's hard to predict what's going to happen. Other questions? I'm waiting for the other questions about the lesson before algebra. Sure. Anybody else? Ask now. All right, and you can stay on um, and watch algebra. And if you have a if you have a statistics question later while I'm on here, then step in and ask. Jasper, you can start your algebra questions. Okay. I'm gonna shut off a couple things. I'm gonna shut this off. I was just turning off my calculator. And maybe this light. All right. Okay. So I'm maybe I'll put this light back on. So there's use the quadratic formula to find the roots of each polynomial, and it is 4y squared plus 3y minus 1. The roots are when y is 0. That's the first step is this was a y. And when you, y is 0, you're on the x-axis, which means that you're that's those are x intercepts okay and so those, those are what we call um the roots is the x coordinate even of the x intercept even though there's no equal sign it's gonna equal zero. Oh, okay so what did it say find the roots of each polynomial there's like there's no equal sign okay but that's that's what roots are yeah roots does not have a meaning to me um, unless uh, it is talking about the low x coordinate of the x intercepts, which is when y is equal to zero. Okay. Um, so I guess you can plug this in to get what this, but this is what it, it would be when x is equal to, when y is equal to zero. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're going to use x, or in this case, it's y, because you're using y instead of x y will be equal to when this variable is zero 
negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Here's your negative b over 2a right here. That's where the axis of symmetry is. That vertical line, it goes through the vertex. It's also the x-coordinate of the vertex, the minimum or maximum point. And then the plus or minus is to the right and to the left symmetrically, right? That whatever this is, distance is, this whole thing here. Okay, so uh, B goes here and there, A goes here and here, C goes there. So you just come up here and plug it in. So B is three, A is four, C is negative one. Y is equal to negative three plus or minus, 9 plus 16 over 8. Y is equal to negative 3 plus or minus 5 because that's 25 and the square root of 25 is 5 over 8. So in one case, you have negative 3 plus 5 is 2 over 8, so 1 fourth. And in the other case, negative 3 minus 5 is negative 8 over 8 is negative 1. So those are your roots. So roots would be values of the variable mm -hmm. that make the value of the whole function zero. So that like plus or minus means everything. Yeah, now how do you check your answer? Plug these in one at a time and what should you get? you should get zero. So if I plug in a quarter and I square it, I get a 16th. And then uh, four times the 16th is a quarter. If I plug in a quarter here, three quarters. Well, three quarters plus one quarter is four quarters. It's one. One and minus one is zero. If I plug in a negative one, negative one squared is one. One times four is four. I plug in the negative one here, you get negative three. Four plus negative three is one. One minus one is zero. So both of those values get you zero. Mm. I'm gonna try one. Anybody else have any questions while Jasper's trying one? What page is this on? This is in the green algebra book. Yeah, we... Well, you yeah, have we it now? Can... Jasper, yeah, can you yeah. share what page you found it? 593, it's lesson 13, um, four. I recommend that you um, do the fat, like do the chapter assessments and also the fact, like mostly, because factoring is crucial in these exercises, go back to lesson six, because, well, chapter six, sorry, chapter six, because chapter six has a lot of factoring. Okay. And then in lesson 13, it's gonna talk about the quadratic formula and factoring by completing the square and you're gonna factor the standard form of the quadratic formula. And then you're gonna use that factored form to solve different, to find the roots of polynomials. And yeah. Next, we're gonna to go to chapter, we're gonna skip over chapter 11 and we're gonna to go to chapter 12. Oh. Wait, is there a chapter 12? Yeah. It's on geometry. Yeah. Good. There we go. Circle. Excellent. For area of circles. Area of composite figures. 
16. That, that would be zero. Oh, divided by three dimensional figures. Volume of prisms. So y equals volume of cylinders. Plus or minus mid chapter. Oh, Mr. Rosenthal. Yeah. So this time the discriminant was zero. Yeah. So then it would be, so there would only be one x, there would be only one root, which would be negative one over two, negative one half. We, we have our work cut out for us for the volume and surface area and area. That is a big, giant, difficult chapter. And we're going to have the rest of the time. After tomorrow, we that's going to take up the rest of the school year. Um, so we're not going to do any algebra? Like... No, I, you know, I, I think it's, if students want to do algebra, now we're doing it. We're, we are doing algebra right now. We're doing algebra. So, Mr. Because Rick that offers people that, that opportunity to get both things. I really want everybody to get the geometry. We haven't gotten a lot of geometry in, you really deserve to have um, a chunk of geometry every year. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. So there, were, I thought there's discriminant was zero in this uh, equation. So it's four y squared plus. This is what we're talking about here. When the discriminant is zero, and the square root of zero is zero, and adding and subtracting zero. It leaves you with negative b over 2a twice, the same. You get negative b over 2a plus 0. That's negative b over 2a. And you get negative b over 2a minus 0, which is negative b over 2a. So you get just negative x is just the one negative b over 2a. Mm -hmm. okay. So b over 2a. Negative b over 2a. Negative b over two. Yeah, so I got it. Negative 1 over 2. OK. So that means it's like a real world solution, but it's... It's a real solution, and it, it, it happens when your graph... Touches the x-axis only once. Yeah, or from the bottom. How do you get the... Um, to flip it over? Simple. Make this coefficient negative. Think about it. So it would be negative like one. Think about it on a T table. Okay. Yeah. For those values. Mm -hmm. When X is negative two and you square it, you get four, but then it's negative. So look, where would that be? Negative two uh, ne would be down there. If that was negative was not there, it would have been negative two squared is positive four. It would have been up there. So what would have been there, now flips down because you add that negative there and whatever it would have been there, it now flips down over there. So it's same thing there. When X is negative one, you square it, you get a one, and then you put the negative on and you get negative one. And when it's zero, it's zero. And when it's when X is one, it gives you the same result. So there and then here. So it gives you that just by making that negative there. So whenever you see negative in front of the x squared term, it's upside down. If it's, so positive, if it's positive, it opens up. Okay. But the roots have to also be negative. Well, no. No, 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 wait. Because just you could just try drawing different things. That one's upside down. Are my roots negative? No, I got confused because there was like, they, they put Y for X instead and I was. Do you know how to use Desmos? Yes. So let's go to Desmos real quick.
Okay. Should I share a screen or? No, I'm gonna share a screen. Okay. So should I like plug in? No, oh, I can do it. I can show you. Four X. Mr. Yeah. Rosenthal. Yes. Yes. Uh, what chapter is it? Thirteen. Uh, which one? Oh, yeah, it is negatively. Oh. Hey. Four x squared. So I, you want the equation maybe in standard form because that's what you're used to. Y, y equals x. Look at what y equals x looks like. Now I'll do shift six. That that little hat, that little triangle, that gives me an exponent squared. Hit the tab button. The tab button brings it down from being a superscript, being an exponent. So there's y equals x squared. But if I were to add an a here in front. That is called a slider. It's going to allow me to adjust A to later on. When I'm done, when I hit the return key, it will allow me to adjust A. Well, I can do that now. Oh. See that? I was going to that was. Look, it, it started, it defaulted to A equals one, right? Mm -hmm. And then if you look, I can, it'll allow me to go all the way to negative 10. But if I click it, it will allow me to change the range. It won't allow me to make a less than negative 10 unless I change it here like that. Yeah. But I'm not, I don't need to do that. Now, take the mouse, make a less than one. What uh, is it doing to the parabola? It flattened it out. Make it bigger than one. And then we can, oh, so like the larger the coefficient is, the, the tighter. Yeah. Now let's see what happens when I get close. To. Okay, so now. There's zero. If so a is zero, x. then y equals what? Zero, which is on the x-axis. Which is the x-axis. Now, go negative. Mm. There it is. What happens if you add the other variables, like bx and c? OK, exactly. OK, so here's what because we'll I do. Plugs, I plugs like What's a good I default location for a? Default location. A good, just where it doesn't have any effect on it, is one, right? Make it one, but we could fix that later. But you know what A does to it now. Okay, let's see what B does to it. Now, guess what you have? You have another slider. So see, I have B is a slider and A is a slider. What happens when B is one? Oh. It did something, right? If B, if B is zero, then you don't have that term. Gets me back up to the parent, what we call the parent function. What page is this again? It's not a page. I'm showing you guys what certain things do to a quadratic. Okay, so when B is zero, that middle term there, that BX, cancels out. So you get the parent function unchanged. Now I'll start adding positive values. What is it doing? It's doing it's, a couple it's, things. It's 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 um just moving it diagonally. And what's happening to the vertex? It's getting lower. Mm. Look at what happens when B is negative. Then it now, where is that vertex moving? The rest of the dots are moving seems to be the same as the, the, all the points are moving the same way. Everything moves based off the vertex. It's all moving together. So if you just pick a point like the vertex, I wonder if you could trace the pathway. I don't know. But if you move both, a and B at the same time, then that would, like that, then that would change it completely. Oh, there's a, oh. 
Oh, it doesn't allow me to place a point there. I guess I could make that point. So I could type in. See, yeah, it's going to be. I can, yeah. So let's see. What is that point? Negative 1.95. Negative 3.802. So negative 1.95. And what was the other one? Negative 3.802. There you go. So now that's labeled. And I can now. I don't want to slide that point. So you can slide points too. I want to do the slider. Okay. Well, now, no. if you did it again, I mean, you could see, is it, it's not moving. I don't think it's moving linearly. Okay, so what's that point? Negative 2.95, negative 8.7, oh, okay, tell me what it is. Negative what? Two point what? Nine five. And the other one? Um, negative eight point seven zero three. Or zero two, I think. Um, it's not linear. Yeah. It's following a parabolic. It's it's decreasing exponentially. Yeah. Okay, and it would probably mirror the same on the other side. So let's see. Yeah. See? It kind of forms like another parabola. It does. Just All right. Like That's interesting. Oh. Huh. Okay. So let me get B back to zero so we can. And then what do you think adding a plus C will do? I'm going to try something. I have another slider. 4X. Oh. Look, and if I hit the play button, it will slide. It'll keep moving on its own. What does adding C do to the end? It just moves it up and down. Something happened. Something weird happened with my. Plus one equals zero. Plus one. There you go. Now I have all sliders go moving around. Oh. All right, and I can put them back. So, I mean, it might be worth your time to play around in Desmos. Okay, but this is in standard form. What if I wrote it in a different form? How would that change everything? Yeah, so let me go back and refresh everything. So let me do vertex form. Y equals A X minus h shift six squared tab plus k now i have a bunch of sliders oh my gosh okay um so now uh if i don't how do i get back to the parent fu function a being one is good what would i want h to be so it doesn't have any effect on the x zero. okay so we'll make h zero and then what do you want K to be so it has no effect on the function? I think that's zero too. Yeah. And look at what it is. It's the same parent function. Okay. Now let's slide A. I'll just hit the play button. Same effect, doesn't it? It's game. So. It a is wider, a steeper, upside down, right side up. That's what A is doing. Okay. So let me put A back to one. And you can do this, you know, you can do this on your own. Okay, let's, let's move H, let's play it. Look at that. We didn't get that kind of movement in the other form, did we? No. Isn't this more simple then? Vertex form allows you to move it left and right. And what do you think K is going to do? Up and down. Yeah. Now I can move it anywhere because I can think of it simply as in terms of moving, translating it up and down and left and right. I can move it wherever I want. I can make it wider or steeper and I can turn it upside down. I can get anything I want out of this. See? 
So vertex form is the easiest to graph. Mm. Well, Tell us where the vertex it. is. Look at where this vertex is. I mean, like not easiest, easier to graph. Where's that? Where's that vertex? Negative three point seven five. Look at look at H. It matches. Oh. H and K are the vertex. They, they're the X and the Y coordinate of the vertex, the H and the K. That's why they call it vertex form. Because, mm, I see. You want to see a different form? Here's another one called intercept form. Not slope intercept form or? Well, you'll see. Form. Watch this. Oops, I want equals A, okay, and we'll have X minus P times X minus Q. You can factor that. Well, okay. I mean, it's already in factored form. Right, so if you, okay, so when it's in factored form with some A being multiplied, an A could be one, doesn't have an effect. And if you want a parent function, what should I do with P? Zero. Uh-huh. And Q? Zero. Okay. There you go. So there's your parent function. Because when P and Q are zero, you just get X times X, X squared. And A is one, so it's just one, one X squared. Okay, so now we know, now let's play around with A. What do you expect? Same thing. Mm -hmm. So A, no matter what form you're in, that's what A is gonna do. Okay, let's bring it back to one. Okay, what about P? Oh, look at that motion. This is, that like was the same as adjusting the B, wasn't it? Yes. Okay. And P is the location is the is the location of one of your roots. Mm. So now I want you to just look at the x-axis. Are the roots changing? Yes. But only on one side of the parabola. Yeah, because on. Okay, so let's freeze it. One let's of the freeze it. Are, Watch one this. Is always zero. Look, as I'm moving it, the left root is zero the whole time. And then it's the right. The root right root is changing. To zero. Now it's zero, zero, almost there. Now when I'm on the left side, the right root is staying zero. So like ten and the left root is changing. As they're both change, they're both going to be changing, but one is always going to be zero. Is it going to be any different if I if I if I um, slide Q around, or will it do the same thing? Mm. Is there any reason why Q, if you look up at the at the equation I made? What, would Q have any reason to act differently if you think about the commutative property? So it acts. And Q and P, is one more important than the other or do they, they're just random variables I put in there, right? Move it up, like. Well, but look, look at, P, look at, you can see my mouse, right? Yeah. If I called this Q and I called that P, does Desmos think of P as something special compared to Q or are they just random variables that the, that, that you're putting in. The random variables. So it shouldn't, and then this group versus that group, you can change the order, can't you? Yes. And then I could rename the other one P and the other one Q and it would look the same, right? Mm -hmm. So then according to that way of thinking, it should be the same, me changing Q should do the same thing that it did when I changed P, let's see. No, but it's the opposite. It doesn't, it doesn't differentiate between which root is which. It's really just giving me the combination of roots, P and Q. It's the two roots. Those are the two roots. P and Q are the two roots. So either the two roots are on the positive side, right? So let's see. If I adjust P, P and Q. We change both P and but Q. But one of the roots is always, the... is looks like it's always zero. So the root is P and the other root is Q. 
Right. So, but one of them is always is always zero here. What if you change both, both of them? Ah. Oh. Then the roots are not. Right. Yeah. So then, one of so and the reason is is because I I had Q at zero, didn't I? Yeah. So one of the roots was zero. So That's it stayed it stayed as zero. That's so that problem. look when q is zero that one of the roots it doesn't care whether that's p or q one of the roots always has to be zero and then by me changing p i'm changing what the other root is p and that's all that's all that it's doing and when you change the two roots it changes where the vertex is going to be because of the symmetry so p and q are the basically just the roots the intercepts is that why it's called intercept form yes and now look at this. I am changing where the root is. Okay, so what, shouldn't that make the parabola wider? Well, no, because what makes the parabola wider? A does, and I'm not touching A. Because I'm not touching A, you cannot change the steepness of the parabola. That means it has to be the same parabola, but going through different roots. And the only way to do it is the motion that you're seeing, is by moving the parabola down so you're getting a wider piece of the parabola, of the same parabola. See that? Yes. See all that you can learn by just looking for patterns with Desmos. Wow. Yeah. Now, I can get the, I can get this to change by changing A, the width, right? If I were to have different roots, right? Then I change A now. Let's make A less than one and widen it out. Now I'm widening it out, but I'm not changing the roots. So it has to go through the same roots. Rosenthal, I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. So in a polynomial, if there is no C, when you put it in, uh, if you put it like. In which form? Oh, in A, in standard form. Yes. Um, let's, let's get out of here and go back to standard form. In the quadratic, if you put it into the quadratic formula, would C be zero? Because, but there is no C. Yes. yes, C would be zero, yes. So then when you multiply for a C, it would be zero. Oh, I forgot A. Yes, it would. Oh, so then now Sliders, so you want C to be zero? Negative five plus or minus. So now C is zero. Um, B is one. Okay, and it looks like what B does is what changing the roots does. So it looks like by changing B, you're changing the roots. Hmm. Can you plug in an equation for me? Sure. It is. 3x squared plus 5x. Okay, so what does the 3 do? Okay, so what does the 3 do? The 3, the, the three um, is the A, right? The 3 is more than 1, so it made it steeper. Steepness. Okay, okay and what did the 5 do? The 5, it moves. Yes. Move it down. Where do you suggest we start in the algebra book? In chapter one, the chapter one test. Take the chapter one test. If you get almost everything right, move to the chapter two test. If you don't get everything right, find out what you got wrong and come to office hours and ask me if you can't figure it out yourself. Oh, then okay. you move, then you go to chapter two and you okay. just do that all the way through. That's what I did in I'm on chapter 13. <laughs> now, now look at the form here, 3x squared plus 5x. What if I were to factor that? It would be broken. And x in common. Single con so where is it? You guys, you're not muted. So it would, it's it would the same equation, right? Yeah. Okay, but what form is it in now? It's in vertex form. Is it? What is vert? This is vertex form. Is vertex form. Um, Let me show you vertex form. It would be an. 
Oh. Oh, sorry, that's square. I forgot. But so it that's would a vertex be... form where H and K are the vertex, right? Yeah. But so there's no one. squared on that parentheses. So that's not one. vertex form. Intercept. This is, yeah, that's intercept form. What is what is P and what is Q and what is A here? Do you see an, an A out there, a constant before you get X? Um, a constant would be five. No, not in the whole thing. Remember, okay, let me show you. Let me show you that form again. A, X minus P. Oh, A. X minus Q. Where are those components? Hmm. Can you get the red one to slide onto your purple one? A would be one? Yes. Your first root would be what? Where's the X minus P? The first one, I don't see X minus P. It must be, P must be what? It would be zero. Yeah, okay, so I'll make P zero, okay. So there's the red one. Okay, and what about the Q? Would that be? Would that be zero two? Or, wait, so. It'll be x squared and then x. Is there something wrong that you're noticing between the, the pink and the purple? One's wider than the other. Yeah. So oh, A must not be one. So A would be. Look in the, my red one in the equation. A is equal to red. Wait, wait, look in the red one in the equation. Do you see any coefficients for x? No. No. You need to get rid of that coefficient by oh. doing one. Factoring out that coefficient. You need to factor out the three. That will give you an A. Uh. So if you, you have to factor it out so that when you multiply back to the X, you're going to get no three X. So if you factor out a three, that, then your A should be three, right? So I'm going to make A three. Uh, uh. And now I'm going to go back to this in purple. I'm going to factor out a three here. So now I have a three there. Five would have to have to change. Yeah, you have to divide out a three from there, right? So five over three. Five over three. So, okay. And then you would have to make q zero or like okay well now let's go back a is three that seems to have the same uh steepness now mm -hmm. okay so three x would be zero what is what should q be then q would be i can just type it in see what do you think q is zero wait the three is accounted for three is accounted. where my mouse is see my mouse that should be x minus p right there. So p was zero. Now you're in the, this last parentheses is the x minus q. I don't see a minus, so must, q must be negative. negative. And then there's, there it is, the five thirds is right there. Negative five over three. Oh. There it is, it's on top of it. So you can put it as, if there was no A, it would be X times P minus Q or P plus Q? Or Wait, P say, that, say that again. Wait. So Q in the equation would be negative five over three. It would just be negative the five yeah another way to look at what p, another way to look at p and q p and q are the roots mm -hmm. the roots are when y is what when y is zero so see my mouse what makes this group zero is if x were not positive but if it were negative five thirds oh. 
And then out here, what makes this x zero? Is if x is zero, mm -hmm. there's your p. So p is in the first case, what makes it zero? Your root. Zero. And right. what makes this one zero is negative 5 thirds. Those are your two roots. So if it, if it would be the same if y equals zero. Mm -hmm. Now, go back up to your original. How do you make the connection to that? Where did those numbers come from? So you just remove, so it would be 3x times x is 3x squared. And then 3x times 5 over 3 would be 5x. What happens when x is 0? You get 0, right? You get 0 every, on every. And if you put in negative 5 thirds and you plug that in, you're going to get 0. Now, if you're looking to see what does having that b do to the equation, what did that b do? That was the numerator. The, that was the numerator of your root. The denominator of your root was? A. Yeah, it was A. Oh. So and it so was negative, right? Negative B over. It was negative B over A there. But it wasn't negative B over 2A. This it wasn't. A. So see how you can get lost in this and you can play around on Desmos and start realizing things in math? Yeah. That's how Mr. Knaus teaches math. It's, it's great. It's a whole other way of doing it. So, and so it's not all the way that he teaches math. It's one aspect of it, but. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. I gotta go to my ancient sieve. I completely understand. All right, so anybody else have any questions? Oh, it's just you and me. Okay, great. <laughs> then I am going to stop this meeting and I will see you for the quiz tomorrow, okay? Okay. All right, take care. You too. All right, bye. bye.